Good evening. My name is Brent Dominero. I'm speaking on behalf of Letras Latinas, the literary initiative at the University of Notre Dame's Institute for Latino Studies. Welcome to season two of Curated Conversations, a Latinx poetry show. Letras Latinas is under the direction of Francisco Aragon, who served as MC for season one, a season whose episodes undertook deep dives into debut books, where each first book poet selected their own interlocutor. For season two, we're telling a different story, a transatlantic story, one that will feature conversations between U.S. Latinx poets and British Latinx poets, respectively. Francisco Aragon and British Latinx poet Leo Boix are the co-artistic directors of the series, with additional assistance from British Latinx literary activist Natalie Teitler, who co-directs Un Nuevo Sol, our presenting partner in the UK. Yours truly will serve as MC. Season two is made possible thanks to a grant from the Poetry Foundation and the collaboration of the Writer Center in Bethesda, Maryland, who, once again, is our host and co-presenter. Alongside Poet Lore, special thanks to Zach Powers of the Writer Center for his crucial behind-the-scenes assistance. Tonight, we are sharing the sixth and final episode of the season, one which will present a conversation between Monica Radjovic and Vicky Bertis. In this episode, Monica and Vicky discuss their books Teeth in the Back of My Neck and Auto Body, respectively. In their conversation, Monica and Vicky discuss language as a tool to dismantle oppressive forces and writing about injustices. They also discuss their families and ancestors, identity poetics, and deconstructing and reconstructing different realities with their poems. Enjoy. Hi, Vicky. Um, how are you? Good morning, Monica. I'm, you know, I'm doing well, but, um, you know, we're recording this at a different time than it's showing in the world. And it's, it's a tough time in the world. So just making room for... Um, for the realities that we are living with and for the joy that we must celebrate to sustain ourselves in these times. So, yeah. I'm That's well. a really beautiful sentiment. Thank you. Yeah. How are you uh, doing? I'm doing well. Thank you. Um, I, I have a slight cold, so I should warn you, you know, um, the weather just changed here in the UK. Uh, it's it went from being very warm, like unseasonably warm, to suddenly very cold, uh, and as a result, my immune system has responded. Uh, so if you see me cough or reach for some water, that's that's why. Um, but I'm I'm doing well. Um, it's the evening here for me. Um, so yeah, I'm just I'm coming here, uh, hoping. Well, I've had a, a day of work, so I'm hoping that this will be a really wonderful and refreshing and energizing conversation. Um, but you know, would you mind introducing yourself so I know I know you even better? Yes, of course, and then to our our audience as well. Um, so I'm Vicky Vertiz. I'm um, born and raised in Southeast Los Angeles, which is uh, a friend used to call it a suburb of East LA. <laughs> um, my writing's been featured in New York Times Magazine, Academy of American Poets, LA Review of Books, and lots of other places. Um, and my new book, Auto Body, just won the 2023 Sandine Poetry Prize from the University of Notre Dame. And it's available now at bookstores. And I'll be reading from that in a little bit. Um, and the book is about, you know, connecting um, my working class background um, and um, experiences with my relatives of uh, fixing our own cars um, and being kind of self-sufficient and self-determined in that way. But the book also goes to, um, you know, has oaths to drag and goes to the dance floors of many queer clubs. And really, I'm just trying to make new things out of various kinds of wreckage. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. And currently, I teach uh, creative writing and academic writing at UC Santa Barbara. Um, and I live on Tongva and Gabrielino land, which is also known as Los Angeles. Yeah. Will you tell us about yourself? Yeah, of course. And congratulations. That is uh, an incredible achievement. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm Monica Radiovich. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a Brazilian, Montenegrin, uh, London-born <laughs> poet and writer. Um, 
I, I think my entry into writing as a, I say career in kind of uh, quotation marks there, but my entry into writing as something that I considered like I was capable of doing it on a professional level came completely by accident. In 2019, uh, I was the winner, the inaugural winner of the Murky Books New Writers Prize, which was a, a literary prize set up by the um, rapper and grime artist Stormzy, um, who uh, launched this uh, in order to shine a spotlight on on unheard voices and lesser told stories. Um, I entered that competition with a single poem um, called 23 and Me, which is about DNA testing kits. Uh, and to my complete shock, uh, I won, uh, which led to uh, representation and the publishing contract. And that led to my uh, debut poetry collection, which is here. Um, it's called Teeth in the Back of My Neck. Um, and it is a exploration of um, identity and heritage and, and womanhood um, from kind of my experiences. Um, but also um, because of my kind of, at the time of writing it, my uh, academic background and my like professional background at the time was in uh, women's rights. I worked for a feminist political party. So that very much influenced the work as well. Um, and I have since, uh, I'm now working on my debut short story collection, uh, which is called A Beautiful Lack of Consequence. And I am also working on a novel, which is called Strangerland. That's so exciting. Multiple Thank genres. You. Yeah, I also write in, um, I write essays as well. And um, it's really interesting to just write in multiple genres and, and in hybrid forms. Um, I think it yeah. informs. Yeah, it informs the possibilities of what we're trying to say and um, infuses it with like new energy and possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, it's not an original quote. Someone, probably somebody famous and brilliant, said something like, I write the same story over and over uh, in different ways. And it's like, that's kind of how I feel with, uh, I kind of went, it felt like a natural step to go from poetry to short stories. And then it felt like a natural step to go from short stories. To a novel um and it but it's essentially the same you know the same sentiments just told in many different ways yeah i believe it was um james baldwin among many of the people who have expressed that but I've, I've shared that sentiment with um with friends who are visual artists and um one of them when i said that i was expressing um maybe a bit of um, i was reflecting on what that meant to me. Like, what does it mean to me to, to have these particular like artistic and creative concerns? And I didn't call them that, right? What I called them was that I write about the same thing over and over and like, eh, what am I what am I getting at? And what she told me was that it's a privilege to be able to work on these questions and with these concerns and to kind of wear them down and understand them in new ways. And it actually makes me think of the way that um, some folks consider like the work of healing oneself from different difficulties and traumas as um and, and thinking about it as a spiral path that um it's not linear right you're not ever kind of done with the things that you're dealing with but that um you look and work with different aspects of these things and so i think that's a more compassionate way to think of um our concerns right in our in our writing yeah yeah um, um, yeah, well, I'm so excited to to hear your, your work from your book. And um, so we're going to share a little bit from that now. Would you like to go first or would you like me to go? I'd, uh, I'm selfishly, I would love to hear you. So I'm going to ask that you go first. <laughs> no problem. Um, so I'm going to be reading from Autobody, which is also my background. <laughs> um, yeah, which is just released this year. I'm going to read two poems. First, I'm going to read... Um, La Corona, and second, uh, Disco. And so La Corona has um, a few kind of tributaries that comes from, uh, and one of them is, is a conversation between Shiri Moraga and Celia Herrera Rodriguez, who are co-directors of the Las Maestras um, Center at UC Santa Barbara. Um, it's for indigenous thought and community art practice. 
and they're colleagues of mine. And during the shutdown, they sat down and had a conversation about um, the coronavirus and colonization. Um, the other kind of um, stream in this poem is from the TV show, The Crown, which you may be familiar with. You may have heard of it. <laughs> and it's um, my kind of conversation with uh, the actor and the story that's portrayed there um, around Princess Margaret and kind of what that means. But the larger uh, stream is my relationship to the women in my family um, and around being um, special or princess-like or just women who exist <laughs> and have to kind of consider one another in the world. So. La Corona. We have been at war with the crown for at least 500 years. Celia Herrera Rodriguez. One, I come from a long line of glass green queens. My godmother, Reina del Paper Cut Pueblo, her daughter is a long night terror. Puro chisme iridescence. They're far away reinas we keep a mean distance from. Ama wasn't a queen, but she sharpens eyeliner with razor blades, the Duchess of Slaughter. Me? I'm a fake princess. I'd rather be Ama's blade, my cheeks of around midnight. We still think talking shit will make our lives sing. We're each other's evil stepsisters, that part of the psyche that cracks two-faced cabronas into broken mirrors. Two. Como eres cabrona, Margaret? The Queen's English is all our torturer, not just yours. ¿Crees que a tu hermana le gusta seguir las reglas al pie de la letra? I, she does love to follow the rules. I won't defend her. They're taking her image down everywhere now. Y que bueno. We're living in three dimensions, your highness. You and me are living in the shadow of the mission. Chicotazos some days and ball gowns another. Our tongues trimmed and washed out and dried the next. Every time you want to look away, Reinita, look in here. See over it, see it over, que te cuesta. You're mad because your novio is trash and because you don't have a job, Margaret. You're mad that you didn't win and it wasn't even a contest, girl. You were just born second. Three. One night, my mother wanted to crown me for Halloween. I was 11. She newspapered the floor and cut tears into paper. She would knight me into royalty. I pictured one thing and she made another. My paper crown was a tendon, a rhinestone tipped and fitted. I was a ma's poster board, the glued glitter where the medicine holds it all together. Four. Margaret, ya casi ni saludas. Your sister just had her third baby and your ass just walks in like it's lunchtime. Is this why New England is so cold? British warmth can be about as hot as my huaraches in a Berkshire winter. That's royal sisters, I guess, así se llevan. Some of us, though, are still digging our sisters out of the rubble that is our fathers and your broken ass empire. Five. The crown she made wasn't what I wanted, not metal enough, too much like Pueblo. I wore it in a Polaroid, walking home from school, I blistered in jelly heels. It's not that far in tool. I wish I could have known how to get between disappointment and language. How to know feelings are a two-way mirror, a test that I could pass. How do I let my thanks and not my judgment be what I give away? That was, um, uh, that was beautiful. I'm sorry, have you finished? Did I interrupt? Oh, oh, thank goodness. That was like the worst fear to interrupt. That was amazing. Like, I was clicking and then I realized that I'd muted myself and not disturb you, but I was like clicking along. That was, um, that was fantastic. I loved the image of the jelly shoes and the tool and the, and the crown. Like, well, that was amazing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Monica. 
is the and the second um, poem is one of the several um gay bar <laughs> poems in the book. <laughs> Um, they're places of joy for me. They're places that now as a new parent are hard to get to. And so um, I celebrate them with a lot of love and, you know, understanding that they are also places that are not always safe. Um, and also realizing as I'm reading that there's a lot of jewels and jewelry <laughs> in my writing. I wonder why. <laughs> I love a decoration. <laughs> okay. So disco. Uh, oh, and the one thing that we need to know um, is um, so Rocio Durcal is was a incredible singer of ranchera music who was Spanish, and she was really close to Juan Gabriel, who is our queer Mexican singer extraordinaire of heartbreak and revenge. Juan Gabriel is incredible, um, and I actually write about him and other poems in this book, but. Uh, Rocio Durcal appears here, and she was especially popular in the 80s and 90s when there were a lot of ruffles and big hair, and she had red hair, and she's incredible. So she makes a, an appearance here, and um, I think that's all I need to know. Okay. Disco. One Saturday night, Mario takes me to circus disco. Our path is a smoke trail of bacon-wrapped hot dogs. We're really not on a date. His muscle tank top is ribbed tight and all eyes are on him. Como copo de algodón hay la verdolaga. He spins me into the riot, men opening fast, cumbia hinges, bodies perfumed in high cinnamon and cool water ice cream. Some wear button-ups and newsboys, others tacones and red enamel. The lights go out and Rocio Durcal walks into the spotlight. She drifts in an emerald dress, her neck as rhinestone vibrato. This is my first drag show, and I don't know the rules. Rocio sings, Me gustas mucho. Me gustas mucho tú. Middle-aged men and señoras who look like my mom hold up dollar bills. Look at us, just regular, regular people. We swoon and snap when Rocio takes the bills. A kiss and another on her cheek. Her lips quiver. The room alight with splendor. Sequins and khakis, tight black skirts and hungry paychecks. Then my brain makes the record skip. A bald dude in a Dodgers jersey walks up to her. Who's this fool? I ask Mario. Girl, he says, don't you know everyone has a dollar? The homie gently tucks the bill in her gemstone bosom. Shit, I think. If he can be gay, he who probably drives a Caprice Classic or maybe a Honda Civic with a loud ass tailpipe. If his bald head can be gay, then so can I. I can be a cumbia riot. I'm not a player like some fools, but I can be hot pants and Rocio's lipstick. I'm saying I want to be an emerald bosom. Go Dodgers, play ball. Play me love is the message and I'll learn how to hustle, how to push my hips so far, I'll knock people down. I'm not afraid. In this sparkle, in the middle of all of us, I am not afraid to burn down this and every song. Did I find my light? Is there one for me? Is this the moon or am I just born? Thank you. It's beautiful as well. Thank you so much. So evocative. Um, wow, thank you. Um, hard acts to follow. Uh, <laughs> but um, I thought it might be best um, for me to read from... Well, I thought it might be best. But I think this poem does a really good job of <clears throat> explaining, excuse me, <clears throat> who I am. Um, and it it is also the poem that won me the prize that led to the creation of the book. So it feels kind of natural. And the I wrote this poem um, when I was 23 uh, and I had been doing a curious thing, um, which is that I would go to this website, which perhaps you're familiar with it. It's called 23andMe. It, yeah, so if anyone isn't familiar, it is uh, a website where you can order like a home DNA testing kit uh, and I would do this thing 
uh, where every few months I would visit the website, I would um, like look at all of the happy videos of people discovering their uh, their ancestry and chatting to their family members or to their friends. And I would like put, I would purchase, like put it in my basket, but then not purchase the kit and close the, the the website and then a few months later I would do the exact same thing and it, it it's it's because you know um being uh, I'm I'm what is known as a third culture kid which means I was born in a country that neither of my parents come from and both of my parents are from separate countries so I grew up with three languages three cultures um in in a country that I think is becoming less and less tolerant of something like that um and so it, I, although the older I get, the less it bothers me. When I was kind of in my early twenties, I had absolutely no idea of who I was, and I, I felt like a big part of that came from the fact that I I struggled to identify myself. So this is twenty three and me. Here's an idea. A little bit of my spit will determine which language I could be speaking, what food I could be eating which box I will be ticking. I have borders pre-coded into my skin. I have passports tattooed into the marrow of my bones. I have ancestral whispers twisted into the drumbeat of my heart. Stories and smells and sounds passed down through skin cells from warriors whose bodies are buried in jungles. I can fill a test tube with chemical compounds and mold my flesh into castles without windows for you, sir. I can send the neurotic, joyful chaos that is me to a group of strangers and pretend I am not afraid. And they will map out the hieroglyphs of my history with pins and threads made of wool, stretching from ocean to mountain to river. They will rewrite the stories I have buried deep into the pit of my belly until I am gutted like a fish with bulging eyes and I have no windpipe left to explain to people all the percentages assigned to body parts. You see, my left leg is from here and my shoulder, it's from over there. As if on a butcher's table, I will prostrate myself and dissect where I'm free range and where I'm organic, which parts of me are mass produced and what of me is inedible. I will regurgitate the deaths, the births, the weddings, the celebrations I missed because I've been trapped here in the middle on an island and they have moved on without us. I will relearn the stories only half told from my mother, repaint my canvases until my colors bleed together violently so no one will ever ask me again, what are you? Because I will have the answers, weaponized, digitized, and they will fix everything. Yes, they will fix everything. Just a little bit of spit, it seems, will pull me apart at the seams, and so I will swallow my own tongue, and before anyone sees, I will exit 23 and me, and in six months, return and repeat. Thank you. Monica yeah the world wants to fragment us and we must resist <laughs> indeed we must um and um I will the second one I'll read is uh it's about my home but it was written um in direct response to the events of 2016 which happened here in the UK which something called Brexit happened here, which means that Britain voted to leave the European Union. And uh, it, it became like a political divide that really our, I, our country has never recovered from. And in the course of it becoming this very divisive, toxic political mess, um, there was so much xenophobia and so much racism um, directed towards uh, Europeans, but, but to anyone really that was considered uh, a foreigner and um you know half of my family is eastern european and i could feel that uh antagonistic kind of sentiments particularly and the day after the referendum results came out i woke up at like 6am and we had found the results at 4 
in the morning and I went downstairs to my dad and he um he said I feel like a stranger in my own country and and this this poem was born from that it's called my house dismantles your house my house dismantles your house it's got three doors and all of my colors my house has markings on the walls my height hers his recorded into post blitz brick and wooden floors dad inlaid himself one sweaty afternoon as the tar got under his fingernails so don't you even think about scratching it up my house dismantles your house it's an empire a fortress and when they signed for it i couldn't even walk eyes untrained, so I missed how the fear made their hands shake and their voices strain, wallpapering calm over doubt and doubt and doubt and calling home to let anxious families know, everything is fine, the kids are fine, the house is fine, the house is our house and it's fine, all fine, we've made it. That's the sweet relief, the smell of my house, my house that dismantles yours. Hung with pictures a wealthy man gave us, my house is a palace, a paradise, with my name written on the underside of the stairs, unsteady pencil marks of a six-year-old, tongue between teeth, determined to stake her claim over this gold mine. Oh, my house is the laugh of my mother, the laugh she took from her mother, the only thing she brought from home. And my house dismantles your house. It's a relic of perfection, a slice of something different, where the phone calls are loud, where dad's volcanic vibrations punch through the floorboards peppered with beautiful errors in languages the neighbours don't understand, where every item is cherished as solid proof that coming here wasn't a mistake, a bank-approved confirmation that the roots put down here were the right ones, the smart ones, a price worth paying for their blood to have the right accent to carry power on their lips and opportunity in their mouths. Oh, my house dismantles your house with its audacity and its pride. It fills the lungs and it swells the chest, the lifetime achievement of the phenomenally weary parents with their endless children. Immigration done right, the strangers said before they invalidated us with the ballot paper in sweaty 2016. And now you question why dad slams the shutters down in the face of your discomfort. But it barely matters to me. See, my house dismantled your house before your house could dismantle mine. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, when I was reading your work, I, um, I lived through several iterations of xenophobia and like violent anti-immigrant policy rhetoric and actions and just kind of constant um, anti-Mexicanness. Um, and so just really, I could, um, I sensed what you were talking about, even though maybe you didn't mention it. Like I knew um, I could feel what you, what you felt and yeah. I think there is something, um, there is something universal um, in the kind of the experiences of being, uh, you know, either multi having multiple heritages or being a third culture kid or, uh, you know, coming from immigrants or being an immigrant, there is there is that universal feeling um, of perhaps like a, um, a, how easy it is for your safety and your security to, to feel threatened at like the flip of a coin. Um, and, and how sad that can be sometimes, but there is also a lot of beauty that comes from that and a lot of resilience as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I actually, I, I think that um, there was quite a lot of similarity, there were these really similar themes between our work, which was really beautiful. And I, I loved reading um, Autobody. And and I guess it, it, this is, feels like a natural way for me to kind of dive in and, and ask you all these questions that I have like on the tip of my tongue. I mean, I, I I love it when people ask me this question. So I thought the first thing I would do is ask you, um, you know, what what do you want readers to take away from auto body? Um, I think about the first time that I read um, this seminal um, book called um, This Bridge Called My Back, like the first edition of this book that was edited by Godin Saldua and um Shini Moraga and I'm looking for my copy as I'm talking to you because I know there's a third editor and but that was also shaped and written by um 
Asian American writers, black writers, all of them, most of them queer and working class. And for me, that book continues to be a map with which to understand myself and the conditions under which I grew up and the conditions under which um, immigrants, people of color and queer folks continue to live in um, under empires, right? Um, the Asian American movement, uh, civil rights movement had a saying, uh, we are here because you were there. And to me, that continues to be resonant all over the world when um, colonial powers see the outcomes of their violence when people are forced and displaced from their homes and are forced to leave um, because of all of those forces um, making that happen. So when folks read Auto Body, I hope that it's a kind of map for them um, through difficulty against patriarchy, against misogyny, for the dance floor, for immigrant kids, wherever they are, for being gay, for like celebrating the nightlife to be free, right? To find joy, to find pleasure um, in life, in in under the conditions that we have to live and survive wherever we are. <laughs> everyone's affected by colonization in some way. And as a queer Mexican American woman, I continue to need maps. I continue to look to Audre Lorde and her work as a teacher when she was in Berlin um, to guide me in my um, like professorial academic life, right? And Audre says that, um, she rewrote, um, I think therefore I am. And she said, I feel therefore I can be free. And to me, I write from feeling and, and that is my hope that when people read my work that they take the feelings with them and maybe see themselves in it and work with me to repair whatever it is we're working on. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, I love that. And so a map with the end image or the end destination being this kind of radical revolutionary joy uh, where you, there is like no boundaries or limitations or like weights placed on you just just for existing, I guess. We get to drive away. We get in the Mustang. <laughs> the very time. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, you 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 use these multi you use multiple languages in your poetry, um, Spanish, English, and I'm certain that there is a third one that I was unable to identify. Um, so, but I, I wondered why you made this choice. Is it a political one, an artistic one? Is it an instinctive one? Is it like a combination? Uh, and like, when do they each have these distinct purposes, or is it like, are you writing the way you think and feel and see and experience your world? Um. I, I think it's it's all it's all three kind of generally speaking like when I use multiple languages it's because the 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 other the other mind that that speaks and thinks in that language wants to say something too when I write completely in Spanish it's like a whole other person speaking <laughs> it's like doesn't sound like me I don't know who that is but it's part of me right um um in my previous book Palm Frond with its throat cut um so the third language I use is Nahuatl which is a living indigenous language spoken in what is now Mexico and parts of Central America. Um, because those nations, indigenous nations, like, don't know those borders, those national borders. And so there are Nahuatl people, people who speak Nahuatl in all of those countries. And so I have a, a tenuous relationship with it. It's a very, it's Poch, I call it Pocho Nahuatl, which is kind of like the, the third culture relationship to it. It's like far away, but I have like a few bits of it that my mom taught us growing up and in this book the the poem I think you might be thinking about is called nature armed medicine and it looks like this so it's like a it's, so it's a pyramid and this is the earth this is how I wrote it and what Nawa is doing here is that it's devouring patriarchy and misogyny and harm against women and girls and femmes. And so the Nahuatl is eating the language. It's part of the earth. It's kind of taking things back. Like the earth's, this is the earth's revenge <laughs> um, against all those harms. And 
Um, the Nawat I use here actually is a poem um, written um, by a uh, Nawat poet. And his name is going to be found here soon. Yes, it is um, Alfredo Ramirez. It was translated by um, Fernando Nava from his original poem, Tu Chalchihuite Se Va, which is actually like a tender poem about like the disintegration of this object. But um, when I read it, it just sounded so much like how I wanted to take apart in some in so many ways this this harm that is done through misogyny and in patriarchy and assault, sexual assault. Um, I also quote Juan Gabriel, who is that queer Mexican singer who's super flamboyant and um in that kind of a triumph of like queerness and like the other and the earth over these things. So languages then turn into tools with which to take apart this thing I'm trying to eliminate. <laughs> And does it feel like there are three voices, therefore, in auto body? Yeah, and lots more, right? Because it's Juan Gabriel, it's this other poet, it's the what the language does, it's resisting these other two colonial languages. Spanish is also colonial, so is English. Mm -hmm. um, and the, like articulating this relationship that I have that is also difficult and that I, I look to like the indigenous roots that I am still connecting myself to um, through this act, like reinscribing. Yeah. Wow. It's like, a, yeah, I love how you describe that. It's like a very powerful, collective, poetic voice in your book, uh, you know, and it's like being channeled through you, but it's, it's almost like, um, and I know they're not your ancestors, but it's almost like you can see like these poets, these voices behind you, you know, like kind of watching your back basically as you go forward. Um, and that's very, very beautiful. And, um, there was like, I mean, I loved the poems, but there was one in particular, um, which I would hope that perhaps you could do a reading if you wouldn't mind, but it's the 69 Chevy Impala. Uh, it really, really resonated with me because it touches so beautifully. It like weaves in these dynamics of sexism, and power uh, and and these, the strained father-daughter relationship. Um, and I, you know, could, could you tell me about the inspiration behind that, the messages you're trying to send uh, and you know, would you read it for us? <laughs> Yeah, um, I think I'll read it first and then I'll, I'll tell you because I think what happens is if I tell you what it is and I'll take the answer of it. Um, yeah, 69 Chevy Impala. And the thing to know is that this is, so a lot of the cars in this book are real cars from my life experience or that mattered to the subject in the car, um, the subject in the poem. Um, so this is a car that my dad drove for many years that I also got to drive. Um, yeah, it was the family car for a long time. Um, and really like the heart of this book, like where it began was um, in my thinking about all of the different used cars that my dad kind of went through and discarded and fixed and then sold throughout my lifetime and it continues today. Um, but there's this, there's this fascination in my community with classic cars and not just in like the low rider sense, but cars from the 1940s and 50s and restoring them and um, that being a real source of pride and being in Los Angeles where everyone has to drive um, because of the distances and the way that the, the city and the county was um, planned um, to maximize the profit of car manufacturers and infrastructure building through freeways. We just can't get around them. It's so... Um, Cars for me mean a lot of different things. So this is one car. What I learned from my father's honking is that women on the street are just like everyone's mom, leggings and long t-shirts. They shoot him dirty looks. I tell him to stop, slink into the back seat and cover my face with my hands. We're all in the car with him. My brother repeats what I said in a whiny voice. Our baby brother is asleep. Watch the road, pinche viejo, my mother says. She sucks her teeth, sighs. Dad laughs, twists his mustache. He's waiting for the green light. There's nowhere to go. I want to run out of the car to Chris's burgers with my friends or to the Toys R Us on Eastern. Dad always says the same thing. 
Ponte trucha, mija. Watch out. He bobs and weaves, punches the air. He tugs his bottom eyelid. Watch everything. Dad can make you laugh, and even when you're mad. He's a real hit. He can get a job, a drink, or a look anytime. You can drop him anywhere in the world, and in two days, he'd have a job and a woman to chase. He's a crooked accountant. His math's messed up. Hides dad in too much information. Be careful, he says. There's a lot of locos out there. He points out to the world with his chin. Okay, apa, I say. Whatever. And I am a great student. He teaches me to look out to give men nasty looks, but also that fools can honk at anything in a skirt and get to drive away. That sounds good to me. Do whatever you want. Go wherever you want. And no one tells you shit. So <laughs> I think that tells you about my relationship with my father, right? These complex relationships of masculinity that I've had so this poem is trying to take responsibility for the gestures I've taken on for masculinity because there is power in it, but it shouldn't be ascribed to any gender, right? Power and agency and self-determination, but also skirting responsibility, right? Like that sounds good. No yeah. one tells you shit. You just get to do whatever you want. Um, but yeah, again, like I'm just trying to like take apart these moments and like repair them somehow and like understand them in a new way so yeah 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 I mean I the lines that I love so much when you talk about how he your father has taught you to be this like like it's like saying be strong outspoken do whatever you want but also uh like here are the ways I objectify women right in front of you and like this will be done to you one day uh or, or is already being done to you um, and I, I feel like that just echoes, like, I have a very similar poem that I wrote, um, which is called If I Could, which, uh, you know, I, I tell it's basically like a letter to my dad where I say, like, you know, if I could, I would be exactly who you wanted me to be. But you taught me to be individual. You taught me to be myself. And now you can't get angry that I have become somebody who defies you because that's what you taught me. Um, and it's just so interesting, isn't it, how you're their little girl, you're their like, their powerful little woman until you turn that power on them. Uh, and then suddenly you're difficult, you know, you're, you're crazy, you're, uh, you're, you're problematic, you're dramatic, whatever it may be. But yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I love that poem. Oh, thank you, Monica. Thank you. I think it's time to hear from you a little bit. Is it okay if I ask you? Of course. Questions? Awesome. Um, so yeah, speaking of, of you know these themes of feminism um, and rage against assault and misogyny, when I was researching you know your work and um, the kinds of things that you engage in in the world, because to me I, as as a writer as a poet, I feel like that what we do outside of the page beyond the page is of course going to inform what we're doing and maybe motivate it as well. So. I noticed that you work in politics and in women's issues and women's rights. So how do you kind of experience your education and your training showing up in your poetry? And um, yeah, and you kind of said you got into this accidentally, but what got you interested in doing um, this political work that you do and then becoming a poet? Um, I think what I've learned now, uh, and it was through the process of writing the poetry, is that um that I the way that I can best uh do the kind of work that I think is like perhaps doing you know 0.001 percent of good um is by combining my co the way that I communicate with uh you know challenging and taking on those issues um you know that I either work on or um or that I have kind of ac I have ac an academic background in which you know is women's rights um, and it, it it came very naturally because the only things that I want to write about and speak about and engage with um, are topics of injustice and like like I think when I when people say that sometimes it can sound very like 
lofty and grand but I think it's because I I I feel very like I feel very agitated by it I feel in a constant state of like terror despair and anger um because I find it very hard to disengage with um you know the multitude of injustices that kind of overlap and intersect with each other and so uh, I actually have recently moved on from that job in politics it was the best job I've ever had I was there for two and a half years uh working in kind of uh, communications and press for the Women's Equality Party, but um, I left because I needed to heal and recover. Um, I needed some time away and also because I have a, a chronic pain condition and it was just, I was not in control of it at that time. Um, and I, I I moved and I found writing like where um, sometimes my skills uh, may fail, you know, in, in kind of my job, like I, I I can't change the world. I'm one single person. It would be foolish to assume that I can. So where I instead direct that kind of urge to do something, to react, um, is through my writing. And when I wrote my poetry collection, um, I was, you know, it was, it was a pandemic. Um, and I was looking at the kind of the things that were going on, the, the, the huge spikes of violence against women that immediately went up, the rates of domestic abuse, the way that when in our country, we were like literally locked down. How the government completely failed to think about what that meant for women who lived with abusive men, violent men. It was literally locking them in with those men and not giving them an outlet. And um, how violence and also mental health uh, rose, sp spiked, because in our country, our kind of public welfare has been eroded and undermined for almost 15 years now. So it's, on, it's virtually non existent. Um, and I was looking at that and observing that and, and seeing the impact on loved ones, on on people, pe you know, on people that I knew, but also on people that I didn't know. Um, and I felt this kind of, I felt like I was on fire all the time. That's what it felt like. And I think that that's why I always say I want people to read my work and like feel as if they're on fire and go away and do something, whatever it is, um, just to do good if you can. Um, and so those two, that's kind of how that really intersects for me. And I think it will always be that way. Uh, like I said, same story in different ways. Uh, the short story collection was written also while I was at working uh, in, in with the Women's Equality Party, and and that short story collection really focuses on um, the like it explores the consequences that women and non-binary people face just for being who they are. But it also dreams of or imagines this world where imagine if there were just no consequences for those things. And, and by that, I mean, imagine if there were women who were not killed or diminished or or disempowered at the end of the story for whatever they've done, even if what they have done is a bad thing. And I, I felt like it was a place to escape when I was writing these stories. Um, and, and I still feel that in my writing. And so I don't think I'll ever be able to separate those two things. Um, my writing is deeply political. The personal is political. Uh, and, and those two things just don't separate. And I think you probably feel that as well and, and practice that as well. On all, all levels. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, my other question to you was about um, your poetic mentors, um, whether they're living, uh, literary or historical. Um, if your poems are letters, who are you writing them to? Um, I mean, when, when I saw this question, what immediately came to mind were Ocean Wong, uh, um, whose work just leaves me breathless again and again and again. Um, Elizabeth Acevedo, Acevedo um, because her work is just, it just, it's flawless, it's phenomenal every single time. Um, she leaves me like gasping. Um, and I think hang on, I have I have it written here somewhere. Um, oh yeah, of course, uh, Noor Hindi, uh, who is a phenomenal Palestinian American poet. Um, she wrote that final poem, like "Fuck Your Electron Craft, My People Are Dying." Um, and I, I think it's perhaps no surprise that the the words and the stories and the 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 writing that that I gravitate to are from people who come from these kind of multi multifaceted backgrounds who have these stories and these this ancestry that they bring directly into their work but also you know the issues that they talk about whether that's kind of violence or violent 
violence against women or, uh, you know, the queer experience um, or, you know, the immigrant experience or what's it like fleeing war. Um, I, like those are the story. those, they are my mentors in a way because like the stories that they tell are so powerful and so poignant and so urgent and so necessary. And it's like, like, thank goodness, thank goodness you exist and you're here to tell us these stories because I don't know what we do without you. Um, and in terms of who my poetry is for, I mean, it's like, ideally for everyone. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it's a sad and unfortunate reality that um, when you are a, a woman or you're perceived as a woman and you're writing uh, poetry and, you know, other genres, but in particular poetry, uh, the majority of people who read your work are other women. Um, men tend not to read uh, fiction or, or poetry by women. There's just like this, there's like research to back that up, uh, which is a real shame um, because re that same research shows that women tend to read both uh, quite equally. Um, but ideally to men and to women um, and to everyone, uh, regardless of who they identify, but primarily, of course, this is these these poems are for women. Um, especially young girls, it, you know, in a way they were almost poems that I wish I'd read when I was, you know, 14, 15, 60, in that like torturous, beautiful age where you're just aware of yourself and hyper aware and ashamed of yourself and you don't even understand why and what it is you're supposed to be ashamed of, but you know that you are ashamed. Um, it's to her really, but also, you know, it, that, that book, my collection is split into two. Uh, it's the it's the teeth and the neck, uh, and the teeth is the um, I, I see it as like the external issues, the external problems uh, that I was writing about, whether that was racism or or climate change, or whatever. And then the neck is the kind of internal, the way that those things have impacted me internally, and that's also again I have chronic pain, so I write in I often write as if it's impacted on the body because that's how I experience things. But I also write very deeply uh, about my sister and my family, uh, my mother and my father, my grandparents. Um, and I, you know, those poems are are for them as well. I mean, there's there's some very uh, candid ones there to my dad who I, I love deeply, but um, you know, our relationship kind of like gum, it kind of stretches and pulls apart and stretches and pulls apart. Um, and there's, yeah, my sister who uh, I love deeply and who um, we had a, a strange childhood for many reasons, none of, who, none of which were her fault, but all of which I blamed her for. Um, and it was almost like an apology as well in that book to her. Uh, she's never read them and she probably never will, um, but it was important to me that I didn't hide that bit because that was the part that I was most ashamed of um, when I look back at my life. And so I felt like it had to go in there. Yeah, there's so much, there's so much repair, I think that can be done with writing. And I just shared this with my creative nonfiction class yesterday, right? Like I, I work towards a repairingness of, of lots of different things and of looking at the hard things and persisting, right? Not just pushing them away. Yeah. So I admire that in your work as well. Monica, thank you. Yeah. Um, and my last question to you is, um, my favorite line in your whole book is, quote, everything changes when your body is a broken city. In my writing, I think a lot about and try to deconstruct what the world imagines Los Angeles to be and attempt to rebuild it with my reality of used cars and traffic and dancing and um, what different things are you trying to reconstruct or deconstruct or hope to um, with your poems? Um, many things. <laughs> um, yeah. Patriarchy, misogyny, for sure. But I think the thing that I really wanted to deconstruct was this kind of um, layer that I think many of us who are privileged enough to be able to go through life of Things may be bad, but uh, at least they're bad over there. You know, they're not bad for me. Uh, so it's okay. Like, it's not ideal, but it's okay. And the thing that I really wanted to deconstruct out of that was, like, how uh, kind of deeply interconnected we all have to be um, for these struggles of liberation, um, of freedom to to succeed. Um, I think one of the saddest uh, and most damaging things that has arisen out of late-stage capitalism is, is hyper-individualism. 
and the idea of like, well, if it's not me, it's fine. Um, and, and also what about me? Uh, and uh, that's the thing I really wanted to deconstruct, the fact that I kind of jump around between so many issues, but the underlying point is the same, which is that like without, uh, without kind of collectively showing up for each other, even when that's hard, even when that's scary, even if you get it wrong, uh, which I've done and will continue to do in my life as I learn, um, it's necessary and it's it's not an option. It is a responsibility um, of being a human being on this planet. Uh, and it, you know, you show up and you do what you can and it doesn't matter if other people are doing less or more, like you're doing the bit that you can do whilst also taking care of yourself and the people that you love. Um, and, and that line in particular, it's from a poem called Chronic, um, which, uh, it's a very personal poem about my chronic pain. Uh, and I'll I'll read it for you in, in just a moment. But I uh, I wrote that because um, as a young, able-bodied uh, woman who has, you know, like a, has like a high functioning role, you could say, um, it's very hard to be taken seriously when you go to a doctor and you say, I am in pain and here are all of the ways this pain manifests. And to make it worse, Sometimes it disappears, sometimes it comes back, sometimes it's here, sometimes it's there, uh, and there is no consistency to it, but I am in pain and it's not normal. Uh, and, and the response is just like, well, you must be depressed or you must be stressed. And it's like, well, actually I'm stressed and depressed because you won't listen to me, not because I'm in pain. Um, but the thing that I wanted to deconstruct specifically in that poem um, was this connection between uh, a woman in pain and a, and a woman who is mad, a woman gone mad uh, and a liar, uh, which I feel like we we impose on women, especially women of color, especially black women, uh, and who, you know, whose pain is even less likely to be taken seriously by the medical profession. Um, so yeah, I, want, I just really wanted to, 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 to deconstruct how you can look fine on the outside but that does not mean on the inside you are. And so that's where Chronic was born from. And it starts with um, outside, this body is perfectly formed, <clears throat> flesh smooth, cheeks plump, hair glossy. Outside it is easy and it makes sense. Only minor irritations bloom beneath the skin sometimes. But inside you get up, you paint the same door in the same brown paint over and over again. You shove fistfuls of the same music into your ears over and over again. You smash your face into a pillow and hope the pressure permanently numbs you over and over again. Everything changes when your body is a broken city whose lights go on and off intermittently. And you must assign the damage a numerical value. Rate your pain from zero to 10, the doctor says contracted in to fix these rusting pipes and sagging walls. How can you weigh the way pain generates a low buzz in your ears when somebody important speaks to you and you nod vacantly to appear normal, but inside you're twisting and turning to feed this monster that hangs around your neck? What number do you assign to that? You suggest five and the contractors suggest yoga. When your body is an abandoned fortress, when outside it looks so fresh, so ready for a fight, when with creepers pushing in through the inlaid brick, but the wood of the stairs is quickly rotting, and now you have neatly folded up inside yourself because the pain makes you quiet, makes you speak in half words, unable to advocate, makes you this bizarre and hunched up thing squirming whilst your limbs lay still and frozen and the world walks by you and waits for you to package up your discomfort in a small and digestible thumbs up. What number is this? You suggest seven and the contractors suggest stress reduction. When your body is a badly planned suburb whose roads run into each other and every left turn is a dead end. When you wake up at 4 a.m. with sweat cradling you mockingly and sourness rising in your throat. When you lie awake, breathing pockets of stale air, unwilling to wake your clueless, sleeping, gentle partner. You lie there, you lie there, hearing the pain flow through your body and wondering what will break you this time. Will it be the moment halfway down the rotting stairs when you suddenly fall apart and clutch the banister to save yourself from falling? There are no words left to explain. Will it be the moment you sway after nobody offers you a seat on the train and the words come out suspiciously smashed together? like you're drunk, 
Will it be the way you zip up the jacket of a slow burning ache, slap on a smile and tell your worried lover you're fine? Will it be the crack of your face as you hit the hospital floor and they rush at you with needles as your dad yells your name? What kind of rank can you bestow upon that? You suggest that it is a 10. A 10, the contractors say, a little irritated. At a 10, you would be writhing on the ground and screaming, but you are writhing, you are screaming. It's just that the pain has learned to speak with an inside voice after too many years of being told to dial it down and scale it back and shut up. But they insist when you believe them, because of course you believe them, that you wouldn't be able to bear it. You bear it, reduce it to a nine. The contractors suggest paracetamol. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you for such a like, wonderful conversation about our families, about taking apart harm, about trying to reconstruct a world that in, welcomes all of us all the time. I'm so grateful for your work and for this connection. Um, yeah, thank you Letras Latinas for all of your labor and love for this um, transatlantic connection. And thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Brent, um, Zach and Laura and, and, and Monica, most of all. Um, yeah, I, I echo everything you've just said. Thank you so much um, for the pleasure of, of hearing you perform for this really wonderful conversation. Um, um, and yeah, thank you so much, Zach Lauda, Francisco as well. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And again, the transatlantic connection is very beautiful because uh, I don't know if I would have come across your work otherwise, being you know a whole ocean away. So thank you. And to the wonderful people watching this, thank you so much for taking the time to have listened to us. Uh, I very much appreciate it. And that concludes the final episode to season two of Curated Conversations, a Latinx poetry show. We hope you enjoyed this season and we encourage you to explore the archive of episodes from season one and season two of the series. With that, I'm Brent Almanero, a 2022-2023 Poetry Coalition Fellow speaking on behalf of Letras Latinas. Thank you for joining us.